All right. Well, I'll just go ahead and dive in. So we have plenty of time for discussion. So my name is Sierra and I am the student rep this year for the PCBH SIG. So welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today and taking an hour out of your day to learn about some pretty cool stuff. So before we get into the webinar, I just have a few things to go over. So here's the agenda, I'll go over a welcome. We'll do some announcements in a meeting schedule. Then we'll talk about our leadership for the PCBH SIG. And then we'll dive into our webinar. And the topic today is developing a family-centered perspective in PCBH practice, future directions and opportunities. It should be a great webinar and an awesome discussion. And then we'll um, finish with closing remarks. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're new here, double welcome. And if you wanna be a part of the PCBH SIG group, you can send your name, affiliation, and email to Samantha Kettle at her email on the screen here, or you can just go to cfha.net and go to our page and click, click here to join. If you wanna stay up to date on anything and all things integrated care news or job postings or anything like that, you can go to integratedcarenews.com. If you have any job announcements or you want to get in touch with the PCBH SIG members, um, you can just send an email to cfha at gaggle.email. And then finally, keep an eye out for our um, newsletters right before our webinars. They're sent out. So I think Dr. Houston sent one out yesterday. It has a lot of good information. So check that out. And this is our leadership for the SIG this year. So like I said, my name is Sierra and I am the student representative. We have two amazing co-chairs, Dr. Gibson Lopez and Dr. Houston. We also have our member at large, Megan Fondo, our secretary, Sam Kettle, and then our um, early career professional representative, Rosemary Hale. In our newsletter, we have a lot of great opportunities coming up if you wanna get involved in leadership. So be sure to check that out if you're interested in being a little bit more active in the SIG. So this is our meeting schedule for the rest of the year. So today, August 2nd, we have our topic. I'm talking about family-centered perspective in PCBH practice. And then exciting news that we have our um, in-person meeting at the conference, and we will talk about meeting the mentor. It'll be super awesome, super engaging. So if you're there, please join us. And then our last meeting of the year will be December 6th, and our topic will be URM mentorship. And then we also have another amazing task force under the SIG, and this task force is serving Latinx populations in primary care behavioral health. It is wonderful, and we just got new leadership there. And the goal of the SLIP is to contribute to a workforce equipped to meet the needs of the growing Latinx population. So please check that out and um, explore more about how to serve the Latinx community in primary care. And then our last plug here is please, 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 if you're interested in being a mentor or receiving mentorship, reach out to us. Um, we have a lot of great mentorship opportunities. So if you're interested in receiving mentorship, please email Rosemary Hale um, and her email is on the screen there. And if you're interested in becoming a mentor, that would be awesome. We have a really wonderful form that'll take about like five minutes to complete and it's on our website and it's just a brief like overview of who you are and what you're interested in and how you want to become a mentor. So please, if you're interested in that, if you have any questions, reach out. And then without further ado, we'll dive right into our webinar today. So I will introduce Dr. Zabotsky and he will be talking about developing a family-centered perspective in PCBH practice. Okay, thank you so much, Sierra. Appreciate the introduction, um, and uh, hello to all. Um, I know I was um, kind of a, a later uh, fill-in, so uh, I figured that in these situations uh, it'd be a little bit more conversational, whether you want to do it uh, verbally or over uh, the chat. But um, I'll share screen here to uh, pull up the slides here. So. Again, as uh, mentioned, my name is Max Zabatsky. Uh, I'm an associate professor and program director in the medical family therapy program at St. Louis University. Um, I have uh, what people call kind of a, a unicorn role. I don't know if that's often a good comparison or not, but that's that's what it is. Um, so in addition to uh, directing our master's and doctoral program, I also do a lot of uh, integrated behavioral health work with our uh, residency in family medicine training uh, residents in family medicine, as well as in our uh, geriatrics and psychiatry 
uh, residencies. I also direct the Aging and Memory Clinic uh, at SLU, which offers different group interventions and approaches for older adults that are suffering from dementia, memory loss, social isolation, loneliness, and caregiver health and well-being. And we also do some consultations uh, and, and trainings uh, around there too. So um, always good to get back into uh, the PCBH group and excited about the conference uh, coming up. I know uh, a lot of great uh, talks and opportunities coming up at CFHA. I'm sure they would probably appreciate me putting in a plug for the conference and the webinar here, but I, I think there's a, a lot of great overlap. So um, I, I know when I, I spoke with Deepu uh, and, and Brittany about this talk, um, I, I think it's it's timely, and I know there was a few past talks at CFHA that talk about um, the overlap of uh, PCBH and, and family-centered care and perspective. This is going to be a little bit different in that um, I'm not going to be lecturing as much. This is going to be a lot more interaction and conversation. Uh, if many of you are multitasking now and feel you want to use the chat, feel free to. Um, I'll be giving some personal stories and perspectives, but really wanted to hit you know, three or four core areas uh, just to get a sense of you know, more so why we tend to separate family-centered uh, perspectives and PCBH work and, and how we can work in unison, because I feel there's so much more overlap and synthesis um, than sometimes what we think or uh, what we describe in this. So, and in just talking with a lot of providers and professionals uh, across the country, I think from both fields and frameworks, we want to learn from each other. Uh, oftentimes, we don't have the time to do that. Uh, that's why, again, I, I love being able to, you know, be involved in so many of the SIGs uh, with CFHA and um, I, I think hopefully having some discussion and conversation around this, it's also about breaking, you know, out of the silos. And as much as we talk about that, uh, we like to be routine in our uh, ways of providing care. Um, that's just the nature of uh, human behavior and, and providers in general. But I think for this group, uh, based on all your, you know, wealth and experience of um, integrated behavioral health uh, and, and other types of primary care practice, we can have uh, a good conversation uh, going forward here. So um, I was going to start out um, just talking about stories from uh, supervision experiences. And again, this will kind of shape uh, just kind of the four main topics. I'm not going to have a lot of slides today. So, you know, again, I, I won't be going through a, a, a 60 PowerPoint deck um, of, of lecture. All of you know PCBH, all of you know about, uh, you know, family-centered approaches. So, you know, mostly how this can overlap. But you know, I, I've gained a lot of my interest in seeing not only why there's not necessarily a, a division, but why kind of the frameworks, you know, aren't working together and kind of sharing three different supervision experiences for me as a supervisor. Um, I have the opportunity to dip into many different settings uh, in supervisory work, um, have the opportunity outside of even MFT to work with uh, some psychology and social work and LPC students. So it's been fascinating to see how um, you know, everyone works, you know, together and there's more similarities in these practices. Um, the, the first instance where I really gained this perspective, you know, on the left, this is our family medicine residency inpatient was a, a continuity of care patient uh, that came into our FQHC. I was supervising an MFT uh, at the time, and, and this was several years back. And uh, we have, you know, several psychologists and social workers, uh, you know, on, on the team there that, that work. And so having an MFT student, they get the opportunities to, to sit in uh, and work with them. Um, there was a, um, a person who had several chronic health uh, concerns, and this was also a family that uh, primary language was not English, and so needed an interpreter. Uh, and I remember at the initial interview, um, the MFT tried to do a kind of quasi contextual interview uh, with, you know, many people in the room and, uh, you know, she was feeling overwhelmed, uh, you know, at the time and said, you know, I know time limitations of, you know, people needing the room uh, and, and all that. And, you know, the team worked out where, you know, she could have about 45 to 50 minutes in the room, you know, to really have more of a, a family planning session, but that really get to dig in on the problem and, and from a, a systems uh, context. Uh, I think it was a really good learning opportunity for uh, several of the providers, especially the psychologist helping the MFT uh, in the room that this, you know, wasn't a usual care 
a patient, there are many family concerns, but also, you know, with paperwork, there is power of attorney issues. There are several things that were uh, complex, uh, not only leading up, but the aftermath of the visit. And so I, I think our supervisor said, you know, I had to learn to, you know, work with the context of an interview mode in PCBH while also getting the family stories and perspectives and where time wasn't as much of a limitation. I know we'll talk about that and, you know, how we merge kind of both of these frameworks uh, together. That always comes up. So uh, they're really stuck with her going forward and, and just knowing that, you know, you can use elements uh, of both of these. And obviously the, the follow-up sessions, you know, proved uh, productive, but, you know, there were uh, many elements of that where there, she was trying to merge everything at once. Um, you know, and, and I talked to other students in similar situations there. Um, the primary care case um, where uh, one of our students was working uh, with woman who had several ACEs, a, a major trauma history uh, in her past. Um, she was also in a very abusive relationship. She lived uh, in an underserved community uh, in St. Louis. And so really trying to figure out uh, you know, who to add into the family into sessions, uh, knowing that her schedule is also super packed. She worked at a high volume uh, primary care clinic. Uh, there were a lot of patients that she was seeing, uh, a lot of warm handoffs. And so how do you work with kind of a larger scope of bringing in family when your schedule, you know, is really organized and, and shuffled that way? Uh, she learned over time to be able to kind of space out uh, not her only her uh, behavioral health visits with the patient, but um, you know how she could follow up with the family in, in more unique ways. Um, you know, getting them involved in other services uh, with the clinic, um, also with the outside support group as well too. So, you know, how much do you really pack into a 20, 30 minute visit when you have you know a lot of people needing to help the patient? Um, I, I'm sure many of you can tell stories of that, whether supervision or your own uh, practicing work there. But again, just the element of fitting into schedule, knowing uh, how many more members were involved in her care was something, um, at least that I took away from that. And we've had some really good, productive conversations knowing, you know, listen, you're, you're working, you know, from the larger family context, but helping your patient, uh, you know, is really going to be important there as far as their primary needs and anything they need to stay in confidence. So there's a both and really that you can use when your schedule is pretty packed. Um, the final example was in more community health. And I, I think after COVID, what we've really seen is and, you know, curious to know all of your experiences, there needs to be just as many push interventions than pull interventions. I, I think a lot of what we learn and, and, and see not only at the conference and trainings in our graduate school, but also in our routines as patients come to us for their care, when are we stepping out of the office and actually going into our communities? Um, so we actually had a, a, a free Saturday clinic um, that we had. It's now kind of transitioning into a mobile van uh, unit across St. Louis. But at the time, the Saturday morning clinic, uh, we had a patient with a really complex drug use history. Uh, again, many of the family members, uh, you know, came into that clinic uh, unexpectedly. So this is where you don't have a routine provider. You kind of have that rotation or assembly line of different students helping uh, as well, too. So, you know, they kind of formed on the fly having to have a team visit uh, where, you know, the behavioral health provider could have an integrated uh, behavioral health appointment there uh, for a brief amount of time and could be seen for ongoing brief or consultations in that model. This had to be more of a uh, developed team approach, uh, kind of on the fly. And so I think students learn that, again, you can negotiate the both and uh, of having those routine consultations for the patient coming into a free clinic, but also bringing in the family perspective, especially when there needs to be more of a, a, a family-centered intervention uh, there too. And it was different because, you know, if you have four family members unexpectedly coming into your office or practice, that's going to completely shift how you're working versus you have a little bit more time in the community. Again, the pressures of the billing and time restrictions you know, kind of open up and, and kind of restrict off, um, you know, versus something in more of a, a controlled setting. So those are all kind of learning lessons for me, um, you know, not just as a, as a provider in a little bit of my time, but also as a supervisor and being able to see how people train and 
uh, develop uh, these core skills as well too. So, so I, I'm going to break up these four topics, just kind of one slide each, uh, simplify it kind of in the spirit, I guess, of um, both PCBH and family-centered work. We have all these complex things. We want to reduce it into uh, manageable parts. So I'll throw this out there and feel free if you want to use the chat or if you want to raise your hand, um, we can have a discussion. Um, again, this, this won't be a lecture today more so. But curious why we sometimes divide family-centered work and PCBH work. I know we have separate SIGs. I know we, you know, come together and, um, you know, find different areas or different problems in primary care uh, that we can work together. But why sometimes is is the split happening or, you know, why we feel, you know, family-centered work is, you know, in this you know, different zip code or or different continents sometimes than PCBH or other, uh, you know, collaborative care model, or other kind of models of care. So feel free to put your thoughts in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, uh, you know, curious to have a discussion. Uh, after we have this, I'll provide some thoughts uh, on the slide here. But anyone want to jump in or or discuss there may be conversations that you've had with with colleagues. And I'll give people a few, a minute or so to use the uh, use use the chat box. And I don't know if this has come up for uh, in in a question or kind of when you brainstormed in teams or or just kind of thinking about um, this this merge overall. All right, we got something in the chat. Uh, seems more complex. Ab absolutely. Uh, time constraints, more time commitment. Uh, it would hear, hear that quite a bit. Yep. I, I think that's something I definitely put in the points there. And I, I think as we've had conversations, um, you know, again, through our, our training, and I, I think in medical family therapy, we've, we've seen this uh, come up and happen quite a bit too. Um, and especially when I, uh, you know, teach students in practice and, and live that often, you know, comes up to what if you spend that extra five or 10 minutes, what is that going to mean uh, in your schedule? What is it going to do, you know, to really honor, you know, what the patient and family may need? Abs absolutely. Was, was curious on the person's perspective of, of more complex, uh, what they meant. Lack of availability of family members when doing warm handoffs versus planned visits to which those family members can be invited. That, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, and, and I think when you have a lot of the uh, team-based care uh, types of skills, the, the planned visit, uh, team visit, the warm handoff, the curbside consult, um, that tends to uh, overlap has not come up to me, but our medical uh, team still doesn't understand PCBH as being part of the normal, uh, the norm for FQHEs and time constraints. Uh, yes, yeah, so ad administrative perspectives and, and pressures come up. Uh, depending on the clinician strength, having strong boundaries and making sure the patient remains the patient. Correct. And, and I think we often have different views of, you know, who really is the patient, right? Um, so I, I, I know in, you know, family medicine, do we sometimes look at the singular patients within the family and honor them, you know, versus what can we kind of combine or have subsets of members looking at the patient together. Um, a typical workflow of primary care is not always set up to be family centered. Uh, so it takes a lot more intentionality and effort than it could be doing so for, for PCBH. Uh, absolutely great points. Um, and a lot of what all of you have listed with, was here. Um, so yes, um, I, I think, you know, certainly, um, and, and I'll mention this too, kind of uh, on, on the next slide more so time, you know, we also come from di different discipline homes uh, where um, we may have different ways of practicing and defining who is the patient. So a, again, I, I think that's where, you know, not only learning from each other's disciplines, but, you know, I've supervised MFT social workers, LPC psychologists who have um, or at least work with them and consulted that have gone into different settings. And they said, you know, I've had to really learn not only to negotiate with my mental health team or medical team, but the setting itself is really determining, you know, what I can practice and, and whom I can, um, 
you know, really practice with for, for longer periods of time. Um, you know, we also have this notion, one is kind of seen, you know, sometimes as a model of care, you know, others can be seen as maybe a family centered framework, you know, how do you, you know, com combine both of that and, um, you know, I, I've been talking to a lot more of the uh, PCH providers out there and, um, you know, where they've given case examples and stories where there's been family members uh, in the room. And I think that, you know, comes automatically to have a systems perspective, which is great. Um, stepping out of our comfort zones, I know, can be challenging, especially right after school and training, you know, learning not only other models of care, but, you know, just learning uh, you know, how systems work. And, you know, I often say, you know, the system's not only the family, the system just is essential as the team you're working with, uh, as well as the community that's really helping the long-term health of the patient. Um, and then do we really have time to learn other modalities and, and ways to practice? Um, so again, myself with marriage and family therapy training, but I, you know, I really learned uh, in an FQHC where a provider was, uh, you know, using the PCBH model quite a bit, um, you know, for me, that was invaluable. I mean, that I was able to observe, I was able to, you know, really see how to structure, you know, the elements of your care and really narrow down uh, your practice that I wasn't used to. And, you know, in, in my master's training, you know, working more of a group private practice setting, there were a few other consulting healthcare providers, but, um, it's just the way you practice and the way you uh, really dictate the problems of patients is really uh, dependent on on the setting there too. So, um, so yeah, overlapped with a lot with what people said. And someone mentioned lack of family system training in certain fields in the mental health world. Absolutely, um, and I I think that even though we know, you know, each other's disciplines uh, well enough, I I really think that the the, the form of practice also has to be organic. Um, and, and I think we're doing a better job of that. Um, I think, again, through, you know, many of these SIGs and through a lot of collaborative efforts and, and practices, but yet yeah, to, to say that just, you know, how we're going to practice in a setting based on one discipline or based on, uh, you know, only our background. I mean, we, we have to learn to cross over and and really kind of play nice in the sandbox there. So, but I, I agree. I think a lot of these core skills in, in training programs have to be developed um, where we're learning kind of the breadth of when you're walking into a medical or healthcare system, you need to have that toolbox uh, to use a, across different sites. So, all right. So the second thing um, I, I'll throw out there is kind of reasons why the family is not um, uh, incentivized in primary care. So, you know, we've had a lot of talks about this and curious from uh, all, all of your thoughts. Um, just, you know, when, when you maybe wanted to bring family in, um, but you have a briefer appointment, when you have a really structured, uh, you know, interview or, you know, a real, you know, specific encounter that you need to get accomplished with the patient, what, what makes it difficult for all of you uh, to, to bring in family? Where do you think we are in healthcare where just, just bringing in family members to a room may, may seem challenging or maybe something site specific for all of you? So I'll give you a minute to throw out some of the, uh, the those topics or reasons, and then I'll provide some of my own just based on you know conversations and you know things we've seen uh, in practice. Again, feel free to raise your hand if you want. You can chime in, unmute, or use the chat box for that. I will say, Ed, as you're doing this, um, I, I even see this too as, as an MFT in training, where I, I've been trained in family systems work and, and biopsychosocial spiritual uh, work as well. And, and I've been guilty of it once in a while too. Uh, you know, sometimes there is that that singular focused and and those those pressures that are sometimes out of your own ways that you practice and uh, it may not be intentional it's just uh, there exam room is not always welcome to large groups uh, great point <laughs> uh, and and i've been trying to talk with a lot of students and trainees now saying um, you know you can still have a, a syst systemic perspective working with a patient in the room when you get family members in the room, you have to have an intention and reason as well that they should be in the room. And now, you know, a few of them may be uncomfortable or have to stand, uh, but if they're doing that and it's not 
a real comfortable setting, make sure that their voice is heard and there's an intention from them being in there. Added complexity, the 15 minute visit, absolutely. Uh, good point. And I agree with the, the timing and schedule, uh, time constraints and facility limitations. Uh, medication visits and PhDs often do not have their own office. Exam rooms need to be uh, turned over for medical providers. Yep, so, so turnovers are, are certainly tough. Um, one thing that I practice with our MFT students and supervisees is how a patient-centered agenda setting is different from family-centered agenda setting. Uh, we use you know, both uh, Larry Mauch's um, uh, PCOF uh, for residents, but also for students, the patient-centered observation form, and then Dan Felix, the diversion of the family-centered observation form. It's really fascinating to see how you have to think of prioritizing the first five minutes with more people in the room and you know how that's going to take date your time and maybe shifting the presenting problems. Uh, reimbursement models do not account for complexity or additional time. You're spot on with that one. Um, and that could be a whole nother webinar on how, how are we creative with reimbursement models. I, I'm sure at the conference we'll be talking a lot about that as, um, you know, especially the last couple of years, uh, you know, reimbursement in the landscape has changed as well. Uh, the family may change frequently, not the same family. A uh, great point there too. Uh, so again, that, that's the discussion of who are you defining as, as the patient? Who are you defining as the support? Um, you know, why do you keep confidential from family member to family member? What has to be part of a, uh, a group discussion, even if, if things are changing? Um, and then collateral information gathering with more people can take time. And BHCs also have a productivity quota. Absolutely. Um, you know, in the realm of managed care, uh, very directed at managing multiple people wanting to have time to talk. Yeah, a great point. And I, I think the productivity pressures, um, you know, certainly are in play there. Um, that's, you know, it's something I, I, I probably missed even on my points that we've had conversations with uh, in our training and our, our talks here. So, um, but yeah, um, you know, would extending counters be on the standard 15 to 20 minute appointment times? So you mentioned that. Um, and, and I think too, it's going to be the negotiation of, you know, if you spend that extra five minutes or if we reprioritize what an agenda looks like, uh, you know, in the room, how do we try to merge uh, both of that, you know, still keeping the essence of PCBH there and, and how we practice, um, you know, but also, again, if, if family needs to be in there, the exam room's uncomfortable, you know, you're, you're really shifting your priorities, how, how do you merge both? Um, complicates the areas of building and coding, uh, as, as many mentioned there. Uh, you know, we've had struggles too, where not just on handoffs uh, with some of our therapists trying to, you know, an add on code to what the provider is, is working with. But, you know, if you have, you know, split sessions too, where you have family in the room, you see the patient, maybe individual for another 10 minutes, how we're trying to combine these complexities of billing and coding with different family organizations uh, becomes really challenging. Uh, it also expands the treatment planning for providers. So I know many of you talked about how it impacts, uh, you know, practice. It can see, be seen as a benefit, but also, uh, you know, if, you know, there's a caregiver where, you know, worried about medication management for a patient that you didn't previously know about, uh, maybe there's other home limitations or challenging situations there, even unrelated to the health issue, you know, how do you bring that person back? How do you try to coordinate care with them? Um, you know, there's there's more typing in Epic or any HR you're working with. Uh, we we don't like uh, you know notes and all that extra time, but if that is is extra time on top of it, that may not be as much of an incentive. Uh, providers may not you know feel comfortable talking about the patient's concerns with others in the room. Uh, there's even a comfort level, and I think even in you know the MFT field and people that do more family systems, there's still sometimes in overwhelmingness that happens, uh, you know, in those rooms. Again, the benefit, you can have multiple perspectives, but, you know, trying to negotiate in your mind the time-limited fashion with having more people in there uh, can be really challenging. And then, you know, I hear from a lot of therapists, does this really fit into my model of care of practice, 
right? So, you know, whether you're, you know, using one of the, you know, integrated care models, whether you're, uh, you know, doing more CBT narrative work, you know, more of a psychoeducation with the provider, you know, when it's needed for the patient, is bringing family into the mix or having family on the radar something that's going to derail me from really my mission or, or direction from what I'm working with. Um, so again, uh, a lot of uh, all of your points that you mentioned in the chat, you know, align with us. So, you know, really becomes the question and, you know, I'll have a discussion near the end of, you know, how do we, you know, try to overcome these challenges or, you know, try to use the both and instead of the e either or uh, really when this comes up in practice. So I, I guess regardless of, uh, you know, whether having more of a, a, a systems orientation um, and incorporating that into PCBH work or just an integrated behavioral health uh, work in, in general, um, what elements do you feel good primary care providers need um, regardless of their practice orientation, re regardless of their framework? So if, if you're seeing one or you're seeing five family members in the room, what, what do you look for in your team that really makes not only good quality care, but where your patients feel kind of honored um, that you, the mental health professional, you know, the doctor, the nurse, or the whole team is really providing good care. What, what are some simple strategies, regardless uh, of the orientation that, that we need right now in primary care? Give you a minute to put that in the chat, or you can unmute. I'll share some of my thoughts as well, too. Yeah, flexibility and can build rapport. Uh, great point. Uh, Patient-centered empathy, not non-judgmental stance. Absolutely. So you know whether there's time limitations, no matter you know what orientation that we're coming from, um, yeah, you you need to have that. And and a lot of the challenges become when you're having different perspectives or conflict that's happening between family members. Um, or they're trying to triangulate you as the provider against the patient uh, to be able to sometimes work out of that uh, becomes very challenging. But yeah, you know, we want to have a patient centered or we want to have multiple patients maybe in the in the room we're working with, including the family member, you know, to be really prioritized. Uh, and, you know, again, showing curiosity, showing empathy, that that's there regardless of what type of model, what type of skills uh, that we're offering. Um, so again, a, a lot that overlap, joining in empathy for the concerns of the patients uh, in, in the room. And, and I think sometimes we lose focus that, you know, we're, we're so caught up on, again, making sure that the, the skill intervention uh, or the limitations under the, the billing or coding restrictions get accomplished. Um, it, it did our patient or our family really feel honored uh, in the room? And again, it's it's very tough when you have family, uh, you know, that are coming in for appointments that way. Uh, there's also an awareness of the biopsychosocial spiritual mechanisms. I, I think that crosses over and something in our training, you know, that we all do uh, automatically. I, I think embracing that and, you know, again, whether in more of the interview format, uh, in some of the, you know, core behavioral skills and more systems work, uh, that that's that's really ingrained in in all of us that that we share and and that we prioritize in primary care, as well as cultural and community considerations. I I think that that is certainly something where, uh, you know, a lot of our therapists, um, when when doing you know a lot of PCBH work, thinking you know how can I, you know, even get more of a broader context of the perspective, you know, is looking at the intersectionality pieces of a, a patient's life. And, and using that intentionally in you know, initial assessments and interviews. Um, you're able to get a, a larger sense and context of the patient's life and more of their uh, whole system, uh, more so uh, upfront. Um, and using techniques, treatments, and modalities that you know, really match what the patient and the family need uh, at the time. And you know, when I've been supervising uh, you know, students in different you know, settings, they may you know, think, is it okay if I uh, you know, I, I, I was more of a postmodern therapist and I'm, I'm doing more, you know, CBT work. I, you know, is that, is that a bad word to use in MFT? I said, of course not. Um, you know, we, we, we can still merge and, and, and sometimes you're going to have to work with that person one-to-one. -one. 
you know, if you're working, uh, you know, with a caregiver there, or you have to contact and coordinate care uh, with the family, you know, how, again, can you incorporate them and, and have them part of the treatment plan? Or how can the doctor follow up with the family members in the future? Um, and you can pass along what works. So I, I think that, you know, using multiple modalities is, is not necessarily a bad thing. And again, whether you're in more of a, you know, 15, 20 minute uh, encounter setting, or you have a lot more breath uh, in a practice setting there. And an emphasis on collaboration and team-based care. And, and again, it, it's not just the looking at the family as the system uh, in practice. I think where a lot of our trainees and new therapists in the workforce, they're really seeing the system of their care team. And I think that replicates having more of a systems perspective, uh, regardless of what model of practice uh, you're in. And I think when people say, well, I think I was communicating and being able to integrate and make myself known. When we have conversations and really dig into it, we find out ah, there's really more that I, I should be doing, um, you know, reaching out to, you know, these specific group of providers more, uh, you know, being able to coordinate a specialist in this person's care, there's always something uh, more to do. So, Again, I think as we're learning, uh, you know, more and more about the operations of different settings, th that's really the learning is that the system is much larger than just what's in the room. But I think, you know, that gives a broader sense for us in practice on how we can merge uh, both worlds is looking at the system differently. Um, so then the final area I'll kind of go into is why is the merge necessary? Um, I, I I think, you know, we've we've looked at some of the challenges we've kind of seen all the restrictions, but you know, for all of you, um, and again, use the chatter if you want to unmute. Um, you know, why at least you know having a a family perspective yeah, is important or necessary. You know, even if you have a singular patient in the room, or again, we mentioned many of the restrictions that are help, happening in healthcare. But uh, why do we still need to have this framework? You know, maybe in play in our mind. Um, you know, even maybe if it's not at the at the forefront. So this is more of the how are we how are we merging both worlds or what what is it going to take? So and if any of you can answer this in a in a brief summary, um, then I, I'll be following you at every single talk at the conference going forward, because this is something we've talked about, you know, is what is it going to take to really, you know, merge both worlds and, and why is it important? So. I'll give you a minute or so to put that in the chat or again, if you want to unmute, feel free to. And if you don't think the merge is, is necessary, there could be um, kind of un, un, unresolved challenges. You can put that as well too. Don't have to necessarily uh, agree with it. I mean, one person, whole person care includes the systems that each patient intersects family environment. And absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think fitting in the whole person into upfront, you know, whether the initial assessment or, or keeping that in the back of our minds is, is super critical. We would need regulatory agreement across credentials. Uh, that that's yeah. Um, I, I think Philip mentioned something that would probably be a whole nother webinar in itself. <laughs> Um, and, and we've come across that uh, as well, too, where I, I, I think still having this for therapists who are under different reimbursement models um, and authorizations than others, you know, I, I guess from a, a competency and background perspective could still have that versus, let's say, an MFT where, you know, we're challenged to have that. But um, that that is a really hot button topic uh, that's that's coming up quite a bit now. So that that's a great point. Um, family influences every person every step of the way uh, within our habits, choices, decisions. So that context has to be assessed. No one I uh, know because it drives so much of our lives uh, without awareness. No matter who we are. Yes, a great point too. So again, I I think from you know, kind of cradle to grave care, even in, in family medicine and primary care practice, uh, just, just knowing again, a lot of the uh, developmental history and a lot of the core issues that we need to address no matter what age of the patient. Um, 
a treatment of eating disorders gives us great evidence of how family approach can be integral to helping clients. Uh, great, great point. Um, when I uh, actually, my first year, my doctoral program was in an eating disorders clinic. And um, it, it's actually great you mentioned that I worked with a psychiatrist, psychologist, two social workers, a nutritionist, and a dietitian, along with a few other MFTs. And it was fascinating how sometimes we wouldn't agree on you know, what we felt was the best approach or the, you know, the best technique uh, possible. And, and my supervisor always said, you know, it, it's, it, there, you know, there's different variations to get to the same, you know, outcome, you know, that the equifinality point there. Um, but also it's just an information and knowledge about, you know, how people are practicing and orienting of where the problem is deriving from and coming from, especially with weight management and, and eating disorders. So that that's a great point that, um, you know, we can look at family, we can look at other societal factors differently um, there too. Uh, to really impact patient health behaviors, the most critical element, uh, chronic conditions involvement of caretaker support and family. I would agree, Bill, on that one. As a VHCM, constantly talk about families and friends in the first five minutes caring and showing respect for people. It, absolutely. Um, so all, all wonderful points and, and, and I agree. So um, I, again, it's all, all to say that I think we're simultaneously integrating a lot of this into practice, but also the mindset of, you know, why sometimes we, you know, have that separation or, um, you know, when, when knowing that we can incorporate a lot of these uh, different frameworks in, into one session. So I, I also say the complexity of the patient and family problems demand that we wear multiple hats in practice. Um, this was uh, from, from Sandy Blunt and, and colleagues a while back. And, you know, when I, I spoke with Sandy um, uh, on, on many um, uh, talks, I don't know if he's on the call. I don't think he is. Um, we uh, had talked about this concept on the bottom called care enhancers. And, you know, one of the things that I've uh, talked to our therapists about is, you know, how you're wearing different hats, but you also have different roles that you're providing. So, you know, our traditional behavioral health clinician, you know, who, you know, has, you know, background in, you know, psychology, social work, MFT, substance abuse counseling, you know, we practice out of our title. Uh, we also have consulting clinicians um, in psychiatry and primary care uh, and PAs that we work with that are absolutely vital medical assistants, you know, that we have to coordinate, uh, you know, new intakes, uh, ongoing patients on a routine basis. You know, these care enhancers as well are elements of, you know, how do we navigate our, our patients and even larger families through the healthcare system? Uh, I've been having a lot more uh, supervision talks with our students, um, a few personal clinical experiences myself where you have to step out of that traditional, uh, you know, therapist, mental health provider role, given that there's so many more uh, complex presenting problems that are coming into primary care and the shortage of who can cover it, uh, you know, that we have to be present as an enhancement of not only their presenting issues, but also um, you know, their, their larger system that they're working from. And so I, I think from our orientation, I, I've embraced that and really have had some fascinating conversations with not only colleagues, but our students around that, because, um, you know, I, again, I, I feel it's not only, you know, the model or framework, but, you know, how do patients see really our role? And it, it's really fascinating. We, we think we're seen as the, you know, therapist, psychologist, mental health provider, um, they may see that, you know, as more of an advocate, you know, coach for them, or even a, a navigator uh, towards other services, which is great. So I, I think, again, there's a both and that, that we need to offer there. Um, the last slide before, um, you know, just kind of open discussion or, or any Q&A, um, I, I talked to a lot of our, uh, you know, trainees and, and even the doctors that, you know, we have a primary care toolbox. Um, I know a few of these analogies are very corny, um, so bear with me here, but I, I think this kind of gets into, you know, not only how we practice, but how we um, are really seeing the needs of patients and families uh, from both family-centered PCBH worlds, uh, but a, in a collaborative and team-based care environment. Um, you know, the, the hammer of persistence to talking with providers you know, uh, integrating the needs with them, being able to coordinate care, 
uh, you know, the screwdriver, we look at trying to find that intervention that works best uh, or the referral that works, again, whether it's to uh, not only within mental health, but, you know, across different clinics or within the community. You know, the gloves are really getting dirty in the room. Uh, so I, I, I tell a lot of our therapists, if you have those really complex sessions or you really have complicated family sessions, um, it, it's not just the intervention, it's, it's being able to really balance out, you know, time and not getting what you want accomplished across there. But you, you, you got to get in there and you got to get dirty. Uh, modifying behaviors for changes. So again, if it's more of that uh, centered approach, the, the pliers works for being able to use that specific skill. Um, the assessment and measuring the needs for, for patients. And again, you know, we do a lot of, you know, contextual interview, you know, work and, and teaching in, in our program. You know, that, that's the measuring tape. Uh, the wrench, undoing conflict or crisis. Uh, again, a, a lot of our supervisees say, you know, I became more of a crisis interventionist um, or, you know, working with several people in the room there. And it, it was really tough. I didn't know what I could get accomplished in you know, 20, 25 minutes, but just then being able to air and having those, those talks uh, can be really beneficial. Um, and so again, getting off sometimes that intended agenda with the patient, if family come in are important. And then uh, you know, the duct tape, you know, covering those gaps or needs, again, not only with warm handoffs or curbside consultations, but if you need to fill in for that 10 or 12 minutes to have a conversation in the room, um, you're, you're getting pulled in. And again, there's a really complex family case, you know, being able to use that skill and practice uh, is, is important. So, um, so again, uh, might, might be a corny analogy, uh, an analogy to, to some as far as just the different things in here, but I, I feel that to get out of not just, you know, model and framework centric, we all share these, you know, across because again, primary care is becoming a lot more complex these days. And we, we just have to have a lot more of our organic, intuitive skills, you know, crossing over no matter who's in the room. Um, but we can, we can still share that uh, across together there as well, uh, too. So, all right. Well, I wanted to save a little bit of time uh, at the end there. Uh, I got a nod for the toolbox. Thank you. Okay. Um, but yeah, hoping to uh, any questions or just, you know, general conversation. Again, I wanted to make this, um, you know, more of information from all of you and just kind of gathering perspectives of where everyone's at here. Uh, at the conference, we're going to have uh, a few more talks about, you know, family-centered skills and principles within primary care uh, in different healthcare settings. But I know vice versa, we talked a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, PCBH providers on, you know, core skills, uh, you know, that family systems therapists learn about. So, oh, we do have a resource in the chat too to share with parents. So thank you for sharing that. So I'll, I'll open it up just to any general conversation or maybe the discussions that you've had at your sites or you know, the way, ways to incorporate family or in time limited capacities more because that, that always comes up. I'll stop share. And thank you again for uh, great thoughts in the chat. That was great. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, to, to share a little bit more as far as information and, and other uh, content on, on top of it. I know this was a very uh, brief slide deck, but hopefully the interaction discussion was, was helpful in talking about that, so. I'll, I'll put in a plug to one, one last thing, uh, and then I promise I'm done. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it, whether CFHA or conferences or, or organizations, um, I, I think in general, again, just based on the primary care patient becoming more complex. And again, we talked a lot about just, you know, family involved in the room and just, you know, different layers there um, is that I, I know we're, we're kind of all in this together, uh, you know, regardless of the approach or, you know, we talk about similar restrictions. So I will say in the families and health SIG, um, I know I've heard from, um, you know, in, in uh, pediatrics and um, 
um, medically unexplained symptoms. There, there's a lot that comes up and a lot of overlap and themes uh, with, with restrictions on how to work with uh, complex cases. So uh, just, just know that many of the challenges we're all trying to find out the, uh, you know, across different specialty areas as well. But Okay, now, now, now I'm definitely finished. <laughs> so thank you. That looks like no other, no other questions there. So. Uh, thank you, Max. This was a, a fabulous presentation. Um, so, and also thank you everyone for joining. Um, Hannah, I don't know if Hannah is actually still online so we can share um, that last slide um, just to close the, the meeting. Um, uh, Looking forward to the uh, you know additional presentations that we'll um, be seeing at CFHA um, on this topic, so that we can all, like you said, continue to work on this together and address a lot of those barriers that we're experiencing in order to provide um, better care for our patients. Um, Hannah, can we share that last slide just to um, make? If you don't, if you don't have it, that's okay. I could pull it up on my end. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone that the sessions um, are recorded, and so they're going to be posted um, to our uh, Integrated Care uh, Learning website. And then um, I also wanted to remind folks that our next PCBH uh, SIG meeting is going to take place at the conference. Um, and I believe it's gonna be Friday morning. Uh, we're gonna have um, a meet the mentor discussion. So we'll have um, several of our PCBH SIG mentors um, and break out into some group uh, uh, discussions um, so that you all can uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. some of y'all will maybe be interested in becoming a mentor after that event. Um, and another plug for our mentorship program, if anyone is interested in becoming a mentor, we are looking for mentors. Um, we have some mentees that are looking for some guidance um, and mentorship. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to remind everyone is that we um, are having some opportunities for leadership in our SIG. Um, so uh, elections will be coming up for the following uh, positions um, that are going to be available. So we're looking for a co-chair, uh, member at large, secretary, uh, student representative, um, and early career professional representative. So if anyone um, doesn't have any other questions, comments, or remarks, um, then we can um, close the meeting out. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone at CFHA. Thanks again for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for, for giving us this fabulous talk. No, no problem. Ho hopefully it helped and kind of address what was needed to, to yes. feel for what, what, what they wanted. So good. Of course. Okay. Y'all have a good day.